Excellent. Thank you, Julian. Um, so I, I think my uh, my little talk, my 20 minutes, half an hour or so, will quite neatly um, join together what we've heard from the last uh, from the last two speakers. Um, and of course, this is predominantly from a sort of UK perspective and from a, a UK university perspective. So um, there we go. HPC in a world of data science. What that means, we will find out. Um, OK, so let's um, let's move on a little bit. So what I'm going to talk about very broadly, 20 minutes or so, um, a little bit about what HPC is, um, again, um, although I think Shane covered that, that very well. Um, for us, what it used to be used for, how we manage it. Um, and again, I'll probably uh, reiterate some of Shane's um, comments about our software stack. Um, and then a little bit about um, our current research portfolio. Um, and the challenges, particularly from AI and data science, that's, that's brought to this sort of traditional um, high performance compute environment. So a little bit about me. Um, everyone else has done that, so I thought I'd uh, tell you a bit about me as well. So um, HPC, high performance computing and research computing, um, actually turns out to be my, my fifth career. Um, and as you can see, I've, I've done all sorts of things. Um, and I've been at Leeds, University of Leeds now doing this research computing stuff for about um, for about seven years. So I'm, I'm sort of relatively new to this still. Um, I'm research computing manager. I've managed two teams of research software engineers. More about what they are in a moment. Uh, research, soft, research infrastructure engineering team as well. HPC platform. Um, run the postgraduate computational skills training program. Um, and this is for... Um, doctoral students and early career researchers, and essentially a program that's everything from good programming practice through to scientific programming, through to some of the fundamentals of uh, machine learning and AI. Okay, so that's a little bit about me. Um, so a bit about HPC at Leeds. Um, so you've had quite a lot of detail already. Um, lots of potential definitions, um, but, but really it's about providing a hardware platform that facilitates large scale parallel jobs. Managed by a batch scheduler, you've heard about that, and running a whole bunch of open source Linux tools, applications, and programming languages. But as well as providing infrastructure and hardware, it's about providing people. Um, and those people are in the form of these research software engineers, a relatively new job posting in UK academia, um, and corresponding research infrastructure engineers, and these are folks that support researchers in writing better code. Um, they help them use modern software development practices and indeed use these platforms more effectively. And they try and act as sort of an interface between the research, the code, and, and the infrastructure itself. Um, and, and I've got research software engineers who, who come from an academic background, from a PhD research background, who come from an infrastructure background, and who've had um, jobs previously um, as developers and programmers uh, in industry. And, and getting all of these ideas together uh, makes for a really, really good team. And without the people, the infrastructure isn't really of a great deal of use. Um, so that's a little bit about us. Um, well, it was all of those things. And, and HPC was, was really happiest in that world of, of physics and engineering simulations. That's sort of stuff that we've been talking about earlier. Climate simulate, simulations, computational fluid dynamics, and all that really good computational science and engineering that Julian and Shane mentioned earlier. For us, this meant relatively little data, um, but models, code, algorithms that benefited from some, some form of parallelism. Um, and and that's, that's where we were until, until reasonably recently. Um, so HPC at Leeds, and you know, this isn't uncommon for research intensive universities. We've got two more or less 7,000 core apiece um, Intel clusters. You've seen a little bit about the architecture earlier on. Um, some of the research problems that, that had hit us recently meant that we bought a load of GPUs as well. We have around about a petabyte of parallel disk storage. You've heard of that luster, it was that. Um, we have around about 1,200 um, research users uh, across the board. Um, and this is supporting around about 50 million quids worth of, uh, of research income, plus a load of postgrad teaching and research as well. Uh, and HPC is one of our specialized research computing platforms. We've got another one, example for sensitive data. Um, and it's all CentOS Linux. 
Um, applications, mainly open source, a few proprietary applications in there, um, managed through environment modules, um, and um, an open source variant of the grid engine scheduler. So all quite, quite classic stuff. Um, as far as the UK HPC landscape is concerned, quite a lot of um, our universities have HPC that looks like this. Uh, we call these tier three machines in one model. Um, our research funders support and fund a number of regional or domain specific machines that we can gain access to via a number of mechanisms. We call these tier two machines. Uh, in the UK, we've got a, a national service, again, um, available through a bunch of different mechanisms called an Archer, called that a tier one machine. Um, and there are a number of programs uh, to access um, other machines across Europe and indeed in the, the US as well through, uh, through various research funding programs. Um, so there's an awful lot of HPC about um, for, for academia and for research. Um, and again, I'm, Shane's, probably, Shane's probably told you this, um, it's uh, command line Linux, it's a bunch of disk storage. Um, our users connect via SSH command line um, to one of a number of login nodes where they uh, prepare their jobs and they submit them through a batch scheduler and the scheduler looks after running these things on a whole bunch of compute nodes in the background. Um, and it worked quite happily like this um, for an awful lot of years. Um, and then along came data science. Um, and by data science, do you know what? This is anything from bioinformatics through to image analysis and a whole load of stuff in between. And I think if, if anything, they've, they've got a few things in common. So firstly, they're not quite as parallel anymore. Um, we started to find that people were coming to us wanting to do lots and lots of these, these weird languages, Python and R, as opposed to the C, C++ and Fortran that people were perhaps used to in the past. They brought with them lots, and I mean lots more data, um, and wanted to do weird stuff like doing in memory processing using these things we'd never heard of before, like Apache Spark. Um, and even more recently, that, that's um, brought with it some differing hardware requirements, um, and particularly these accelerators. Um, I think right at the very start, um, Julian mentioned um, a talk uh, a little bit later on in the year um, or, or a session on FPGAs. So FPGAs are on our roadmap as well, um, but really for development at the moment, um, our deep learning colleagues have a, a really big and increasing demand um, for GPU accelerated uh, compute nodes and research. So what I'm going to talk um, talk about next, I think a little bit of a, a little bit about the portfolio of AI research um, that we've got at Leeds, um, and then I'll wrap up right at the very end with um, what the challenges were this brought with us, um, and um, how how we're attempting to deal with it. So, looking at one very focused area. Of, of AI research just in our computer science uh, school. We have around about 50 researchers involved in uh, AI in computer science. Uh, we host the uh, UKRI, that's the uh, UK Research Infrastructure Centre for Doctoral Training in AI for Medical Diagnosis and Care. That's a newly awarded um, doctoral training centre. Um, we're going to be hosting 50 odd PhD students um, uh, that's brought with it around about six million pounds worth of income. Um, we host the Northern Pathology Imaging Cooperative as well. So there's an awful lot of image analysis going on here. We're a partner in um, the, the UK um, AI Institute, the Alan Turing Institute. Um, and we also host just in this one school, the EPSRC. So that's the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council. That's one of our national funders, the National Facility for Innovative Robotic Systems. And just in science and engineering, and this, we're not even talking about digital humanities and medicine and health, um, just in science and engineering, we've got AI applications in environmental sciences, in biological sciences, in engineering design, in healthcare, in process engineering, and in molecular modeling. In terms of data, we're seeing very much a move towards working with, with multimodal data. So um, a mixture of structured and unstructured data, video, text, images, and genomic data. Um, and this has proven for us a bit of a headache. 
um, not only the nature of the data itself, but the sheer volume of data um, that some of our researchers are generating. So we've, we've experimental equipment and we've simulation that, that could potentially be generating um, tens and tens of petabytes of data um, for us to deal with. And that's a challenge we've yet to meet. So some of the projects that we're, um, that we're working on. So a little example here. Um, um, we've uh, an AI program that's attempting to model um, all of the underground cables, pipes and tunnels. Um, came as a surprise to me that this is appallingly badly mapped. Um, and when our friends are digging up the roads, etc., they're not always too sure what they're going to find. Um, so what we've got uh, is a program here that will take lots and lots of different um, x-ray and uh, other types of imagery and attempt to map and represent where all these underground uh, cables and pipes are so when our roads and pavements are being dug up they're not going to um, dig into the cables that's that's one program um, a bunch of stuff in engineering design um, so this is the um, the type of stuff that we've, we've heard a little bit about before these applications like um, uh, Francis Fluence um, but we're applying artificial intelligence and modeling to these as well to augment the human-based design process. Um, a whole bunch of scientific discovery. So we're analyzing biological systems um, and using that to um, suggest models for, uh, for, for movement. So, so this particular one here, um, is with uh, a, a research group who's who's modelling the uh, the behaviour of a worm um, and using that potentially to uh, to recreate um, autonomous systems that can carry cameras and other sensors through the human body. You know, modelling the way they swim, and that turns out to be a really good way um, to get this this sensor device from from one end of your body to the other. Um, I, I'll leave that to your imagination. Um, creating digital humans um, and digital twins, we've, we've heard a little bit about that before as well. Um, so there's an enormous amount of research into creating digital humans and digital twins of, of all types. Um, anomaly detection. So again, this is a sort of classic deep learning problem. Um, and you know, we've got this type of example here where we uh, CCTV imagery, looking for people that are behaving in a particular anomalous way so that we can we can track them for safer behavior and you might notice if this is if this is reproducing at all on your screens um, it might be picking up things that are in people's hands um, so it's this type of thing yeah you get the idea um, and this has massive demand massive computational demand especially in the, the training of these deep learning, deep learning models um, Huge amount of research, Leeds has got a medical school, so a huge amount of research in how patients um, interact um, with the National Health Service and whether their pathway through the system and their treatment pathway can be, can be improved in any way. Um, so this is, the type of, uh, this is the type of thing we're modeling here. Um, a huge amount of, of, of climate modeling and climate forecasting, that again is a, um, a big research area. Um, at Leeds. So we're starting now to apply um, deep learning modeling to some of the more traditional climate forecasting. Um, and we're taking here radar imagery, um, let's say 3,000 frames worth of data through a complex deep learning model, 32 hours to train a model. Um, and remember, we've 50 or 100 PhD students working on this type of work. Once upon a time, we would have bought each of them a GPU um, accelerated workstation. Um, whoops, a GPU accelerated workstation. That turns out to be remarkably expensive. So we put all of our investment into HPC. Um, but that needs to be managed, of course. A whole bunch of um, linguistic and, um, and an image analysis as well. So one of the more interesting sets of projects that have come around um, recently with um, research into COVID-19, um, there are a couple of research projects just starting up at the moment that are doing some, some automated literature 
uh, reviews of papers on COVID-19. And again, huge volumes of data um, and complex machine learning and deep learning models um, impacting on how our, how our HPC is designed as well. Um, what else have we got? So augmenting human intelligence. So um, expert systems, but machine learning and deep learning augmented expert systems, helping people make better decisions um, based on the information that we're able to gather for them. So that's a bit about our portfolio. Um, and that's just in one particular school. And for us, the challenges that that's brought with them has, has been predominantly around the design of our HPC platforms. So up until now, that, that infrastructure support has been via our classic HPC. Okay, so we bought classic HPC, GPU nodes, um, and occasionally we do invest in um, some ad hoc desktops with a massive variety of consumer grade GPUs. And for our, our IT department, trying to manage that huge estate has been, has been quite difficult. Um, but as we started particularly down this road of supporting deep learning and these new PhD programs, um, there's been loads more demand um, for, for deep learning projects. And, and that's brought with it a, a, a demand, a requirement to change what our infrastructure looks like. So we're moving away from that um, simplistic HPC model of the past with lots and lots of Intel cores and a bunch of storage to something that looks an awful lot more varied. So as I say, GPUs have hit us most recently. As we mature in our journey um, in, in deep learning data science, then FPGAs are gonna become more interesting as well. Um, I don't think any of us have really touched on perhaps the inherent insecurity of the architecture um, of, of HPC. We could talk, I think any of us could talk about that in a little bit more depth, but in essence, once you're on a cluster, it's not really too difficult to work out what other people are doing. So I'll leave you on this one. The biggest challenge that we've got at the moment is how to do deep learning, the scale that we manage with HPC, um, but with, with data that's deemed sensitive. And, and most of the time, this is, this is live patient data that we might be using for diagnosis. Um, so that's it. So that's just a bit of a flying visit through everything we're, we're doing at Leeds. That's about 20 minutes. I've kept within my time. Um, so, um, so we'll leave it there, I think. Um, Julian, back to you. Wonderful. Thank you for the, for the talk. And I hope that every one of the attendees is saying that uh, high performance computing, university research is actually really an important aspect mm. and it integrates very well with open source. And let me just check Absolutely. if there's any, there are now actually questions coming in. Uh, let me say, oh yeah, there's one question for you. Uh, that is, is the scale of the Leeds HPC system required primarily for model training or inference or a mixture of both so at the moment um it i would say probably probably our workload is is 80 percent training and about 20 percent inference so i think my comment about um, fpgas is that our, our roadmap is to explore um fpgas a little bit more for the inference side um as uh, as as these models mature we're going to need to look at how we how we infer um, a little bit more efficiently, um, but pr predominantly for for training at the moment. What do you think? Um, one just to add on this, would you think that the traditional HPC business, uh, you know, that this will be like fifty percent uh, in the long run, or do you think that uh, the machine learning kind of new kind of access patterns will uh, make reduce the the importance of HPC further? So I think our experience is, is, a, is at Leeds is that the demand from those more traditional HPC areas has not diminished at all. Um, and in fact, that's that's increased um, as, as well. To give you a, a sort of rough idea. So I mentioned I've been at Leeds about seven years. So when I joined seven years ago, we had around about 300 HPC users, um, and we've we've quadrupled that um, in um, in in that seven years. 
Now, around about half of that demand has come from, from all of these new data science type areas that, that I mentioned. Um, but the rest of the demand has come from traditional from traditional HPC areas as well. People are wanting to do more of that, you know, I, I use the word reservedly, but they're wanting to do more of that traditional research. Where that's going to take us in the future, I think gets even more interesting. Um, what we've not, the other big challenge as well, of course, is, is the funding challenge to this. Um, I think, you know, Julian knows, knows this business quite well as well, that University HPC in the grand scheme of things is quite cheap. Um, but nonetheless, universities and, and funders um, are reluctant to spend anything they don't have to spend on. So we have to make a, we have to make a really good case um, and work with our researchers who are applying for their grants to make sure that we build in uh, funding, not only to do more of the same, but to do more interesting stuff in the future as well. Okay, great. So, thanks. So there's another question. So this is for you, Shane. Um, so for NERSC, how do you manage the containers and environment? Can users run any container, container, or is there a repository that is kind of curated by NERSC? So um, we, since we're a kind of open research facility, we pretty much allow them to use any container. So there's no, um, you know thing that it has to pass through before it can be used on the system. Uh, we do have a special, we use Shifter, you know, there's other examples like Singularity that are used to run those containers in a secure way that you couldn't do with Docker until some very recent developments. Um, the other thing I'll say is we kind of look at the container as just an extension of what the user would be able to do anyway. So they can already, we allow them to pull down software and build it and run it locally. So we don't see any additional kind of risk exposure by allowing them to run that using a container. If they were using the container for a service, like in our spin system, where it's exposed to the to the internet, um, then we will, you, you we might have some scans of it and we may have them patch it or do updates depending on, you know, what we see. I wanted to comment real quickly on the previous question about um, training versus inference. I think we see something similar at NERSC. Right now it's predominantly training. I think that's because people are still trying to apply these new approaches to scientific problems. Um, and as far as scale goes, I think that's where you can kind of leverage for the training says that's where the scale still is useful. You. I think we are also going to see, and we see a little bit of this already, where people combine sort of traditional HPC approaches like for modeling and simulation, but integrate um, machine learning techniques into those workloads. So that could be for um, preconditioning their their simulations to maybe set up the initial conditions more closely to the expected kind of um, you know point that things will kind of go to, or also to do things like feature detection inside a running simulation. So for example, we have climate runs where they use it to identify storms in those climate simulations. And so they can count how the number of storms is changing, you know, over time, for example. Okay, great. Um, so let me now read again the question. So how can research using HPC lead into exploitation? in the real world on smaller systems, given that every not everyone can afford 10,000 node systems? And my answer would be, just to extend what has been said, that uh, generally you see a lot of industry applications that doesn't need to, to run on thousands of nodes, but of in the range of hundreds of nodes, maybe GPU accelerated, um, that then benefit from the research that happens on the large scale, the bleeding edge research, basically that happens, that then trickles down into real applications in industry. And there have been quite some great analysis that shows how much revenue do you generate when you invest a couple of uh, dollars into HPC. Uh, I don't recall the numbers, maybe someone else from the panel does. Um, I think it was something like four times or something um, 
but I may be wrong. So someone else from the panel wants to add something to this? Um, so I'm, so I'm, I'm multi, are you, are you talking about multiplier there? Of, uh, yeah, I was talking about the uh, the benefit yeah. that you get to invest into HPC, basically. We, we, we work on a basis of about, about a four-fold multiplier, yeah. That's fair, that's fairly well borne out by by experience. Yeah, I I think my comment would be is um, the the dirty little secret to some degree is while we like to trumpet these really large hero runs that happen on the big systems, a lot of science and you know a lot of work is done at much smaller scales. And so if you look at the breakdown of jobs on a system like Quarry the largest number of jobs run at smaller scales. Mm -hmm. If you look at total CPU time, it might be more balanced out. But, um, you know, there's a lot of examples from chemistry simulations that often may only need to run across a single node or a small number of nodes. A lot of data analytics might happen on a single node, but you might do a large array of jobs to kind of work through it more quickly. So you see all shapes and sizes, and it does become potentially a stepping stone to where you may have a problem that requires something something larger. Yep, absolutely. So so sort of university level HPC is a really good training ground, um, not only for the computational problems, but for the researchers themselves to, to learn the benefits um, of scaling and parallelism and different approaches to solving their scientific problems. Um, so, you know, we've, we've two 7,000 core, core machines at, at, at Leeds, and I can honestly tell you we've only once had um, a, a research problem that's needed to make use of uh, all of the 7,000 cores in a particular machine. Um, in fact, 22% of, um, of our jobs are, are single core serial jobs in the sort of data analytics stuff that, um, that, that Shane was talking about. But we've got researchers who, who might be running that same analysis, often written in, in R or Python, tens or even hundreds of thousands of times. And you know, outsourcing that to this HPC cluster that someone else looks after, and, and indeed we even train the researchers how to use it effectively, um, it is great because it means they can then go back to you know, watching cat videos on the desktop or laptop computer, um, you know, rather than running loads and loads of jobs one after the other. So we have another question here uh, by Jeremy. He asks, he he makes the comment that a lot of money is spent on HPC hardware, which is true, but around a third of all software is compiled still with GNU Fortran, meant by maintained by a couple of people only. So how do we get HPC to invest more in open source tools? Right. So applying modern compiler optimizations to GNU Fortran could be a very cost-effective way of increasing performance. So what do the panelists Yeah, I have a couple of comments on there. I think, um, I, I think there are contributions that indirectly flow from HPC back to those, those pieces. So for example, there may be contributions from the chip vendors to those compilers to have them run better. And we've purchased a lot of processors, we've set benchmarks on it. It might drive some of that development indirectly. But I think the point is still valid. There's a lot of, I don't think you even have to limit it to things like compilers. There's just a lot of part of the broader ecosystem that we take advantage of that oftentimes do get neglected. You know, and an example that we had a while back, um, you know, it's been three or four years now was where SSL was, OpenSSL was really not getting the love and attention that it needed. And everybody was using it. And you know, when they discovered the heart bleed problems and these other attacks, um, you know, you just realized that there was we weren't doing a good job of, of nurturing that that community. So I think it is a challenge. Maybe Carl uh, something to say to that that one. So I, I would uh, I, I would tend to agree with that. In that, um, you know, you're quite right. Many of these um, open source programs appear to be managed um, by very large groups of people, uh, and invariably not. It's just, um, you know, it's two blokes and a dog. Um, 
university level HPC, I think I think your, your, your question or your comment was it's it's well funded. I would probably argue it, it's not particularly well funded. Um, we we are definitely in in terms of um, in terms of research income the the, the poor relation. Uh, we do remarkably well on the funding that we get. Um, I think we spend about 2.2 million on each HPC machine. Um, and that's, you know, I, I used to joke that that was less than the university spends on photocopying paper. Um, but you know what, over the four or five year life of the machine, it, it turns out it's not. Um, so I think all of us are in this position that, you know, that sometimes the, the whole open source movement um, produces fantastic outputs on very little money. And I think the challenge is, how do we direct people and funding to do that even better? Look what we do with nothing. Imagine what we could do if, if we could actually have something. Yeah. To, to add to this point, I, I know for sure that a lot of people have thought about this issue. So they looked really into the kind of the um, financial aspects and said, you know, it would be better to invest into brainware compared to hardware maybe. But right. the problem was, really, as Martin said, it is kind of the way the funding is made that made it really difficult to direct a, even a, a euro or something into any kind of software development effort that would maybe be worth 10 euro in the end in terms of hardware. Right. So, but I think that people have realized that and they try to work and find some solutions on the political level, but it's, um, it is an ongoing many, for many years now, for several years, uh, process. So I hope they get it resolved. Um, what people do when they procure a system at the moment is that they basically would ask, they say, okay, I give you my benchmarks and then the vendor would figure out, okay, if the, the best solution to get this benchmark run fast is maybe to improve the new Fortran compiler, right? So they would surely look into this option and, and do some kind of um, yeah. analysis. But what you sometimes then get is you get, the, for example, the Intel compiler, right? Because maybe they have spent more money in it and they, they figured it, it is price competitive, so to say. Um, I think there's, it's really a tricky point, but a very good remark. You're me. So we have one last question, except if someone wants to say something to this one. Um, yes. Okay, good. So there is, oh, that actually, okay. Oh, Jeremy replies. Um, yes, the chip vendors all pay for C and C++ work. The GNU Fortran, well, it's for volunteers. Yeah. I, I hope, yeah. Yeah. I would hope that Fortran goes away at some point anyway, but uh, it's a different issue. Um, yeah, don't know what to make with this one. So, okay. So we have one question. Um, okay. Sha Shaki Rudin asks, he is a soon to graduate PhD in computational EM. I don't know what that is. Um, he is interested in scientific and high performance computing. Uh, could you shed some light on how one gets into the field? For example, he mentions HPC carpentries the way as a way. Two, um, what what has career progression looked like? Oh my God! Okay, really long question. And three, um, at what point in a research project do you come into play? Um, is it in helping researchers run their code from the development phase and so on? And there are a lot of questions. I'd say this is probably a too complicated question to address it. Um, here, my answer is basically what you need to do um, to you get in touch in, in some kind of HPC conferences. For example, the ISC HPC conference that happens mid of June will be uh, in a virtual conference. So it's free for everyone to attend. So you attend those kind of conferences. You get an impression about uh, the technology that is needed. And then um, there are a lot of different roads. Um, to get into HPC, you can come from the application side, uh, and it's really very diverse. But best is to talk, I think, with people from data centers that are 
in your um, country, like in the UK, and they can give you advice, or of course you can write, but it probably is a too big answer. Does any one of the panelists has a quick answer for Chuck Gruden? Yeah, I'll, I'll just quickly say, yeah, I would echo Julian's comment. The, the, um, the big conferences are good opportunities to kind of see the community network, get to know people. Like you said, there's so many different career paths that you can do in HPC, everything from sort of working in the center, helping other users to being, a, you know, developers, a part of a project. Um, you know, so it all depends on um, what excites you and a little bit about your, you know, your background and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in terms of conferences, um, Although there's a you know there's a lot of weird stuff going on this year, I think there's a there's there's a huge opportunity that folks might never get again, um, as many of the the big um, HPC and, and sort of research computing conferences are going online, is to is to at least get a, a, some exposure to the type of um, to the type of work and and there might be some limited um, opportunities for networking as well. Um, so do keep an eye on, for example, ISC. Um, and end of June, I think, Julian, isn't it? End of June or thereabouts. Um, you know, lots and lots of online um, seminars, tutorials, workshops, um, and you can start to see and interact with the people who are who are doing things in, in the field. So we have one last question from Steve. So do the speakers see a place for cloud vendors who can provide a temporary large cluster where the open source nature of the software may be an advantage, freely available, no license issues, software can be modified for the environment. And my quick answer would be, we know already this kind of um, software solutions that exist in which you can spawn ad hoc clusters, even using technology that comes from HPC, like the Lustre file system or with Ceph. Um, unfortunately, I would say, these companies that offer this commercially not often pay back uh, the direct um, development of those technologies they use. So basically they use the money to develop their own products based on existing solution. Um, does anyone want to extend something? I would just agree and say absolutely. There are, there are people that are doing, you know, workloads that way. And I think it's particularly a good approach if you're you know, if you're on a project that's just getting started, you don't really know what your demand is. It's not very maintained and you maybe don't have access to, um, you know, uh, some uh, some run, you know, uh, an HPC center or something like that. It's definitely a good option. There's there's limits to what you may be able to do at the largest scales, but it can be very useful, I think, for that small to medium for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we've, we've had a couple of use cases at Leeds, particularly for, um, for teaching and learning, where we've needed to do something slightly differently with, with undergrad programs who we've wanted to keep away from our uh, research HPC. Um, and it's proved to be to be quite useful to start to explore this, this, sensitive, um, this sensitive data um, HPC use case that we've got as well, that um, it turns out that it's, it's quite straightforward, he says quite straightforward to build um, secure HPC bubbles um, in, in one of the private clouds, even if it turns out to be quite a bit more expensive than it, than it does to be to run on our, our on-premise HPC. All right, that was, that is, was basically the last question. And I think it was a wonderful evening. I really enjoyed uh, the questions and uh, we will put up the videos tomorrow. And if you have a further question, I think you can contact the uh, speakers later on. And I hope to see you again in, in a month's time for the next monthly uh, open source specialist group meeting. And thank you very much for the speakers. I, I particularly really appreciate those speaking from a foreign country, a different time, different time zone. And wish you all well. Bye. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.